welcome to our Social Work Day on the Hill event here at uh, <laughs> NYU. And we're going to talk about a really important topic. Um, those of you who may have been, fo have been following uh, the news know that we have many issues facing our country right now. And uh, Nancy McLean, uh, the Duke historian, documented a lot of these problems in her book, Democracy in Chains, where she uh, <clears throat> wrote about how the uh, libertarians and others were dominating our, le our elections and then ultimately our governance and policies. And so we are here to talk about what can social work do. We've had, we had this, we were supposed to have this conversation last year and it snowed, so we didn't get a chance. But the deans and directors did have this conversation, but we wanted to hear what young social workers are thinking about these issues, and so that's why we're here today, and hopefully uh, uh, <clears throat> we will all be involved in the, in the uh, discussion. So I'm going to bring on our panel. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, our moderator is Daryl. Campbell, you can read about him in, in the program. Daryl is a very, uh, uh, how would I say it, a very outgoing young man who um, definitely has leadership abilities. And he, uh, I first met him at, when he attended our boot camp. And now uh, <coughs> he's graduated Barrow University and making his way in the world. So I'm just going to turn this over to you, Daryl, and uh, take care. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, participating in all the activities that we have, uh, have you partake in. I know yesterday was a lot with the running around on Capitol Hill, but I think that's the best part of it. You know, for me, when I was a student um, and I was sitting in those seats, I I hated like just sitting down and listening. For me, I'm more of an action person. You can only talk to me for so long before I'm like, let's let's get to some work. Let's let's do something because the ideas that we developed in these seats were so uplifting. It's like. No, I, I, I want to do some work, and I want to get the action done. So yes, uh, I hope you had a great time yesterday. And um, the experiences that you got here, the people that you met are so uplifting that uh, you take it to your own prospective communities, and you share that, and you, up, you bring your communities to um, a place of improvement, of empowerment, and betterment. So thank you, thank you. Um, I'm sitting here trying to think how we're going to introduce our panelists. We have a lot of panelists today. Um, it's five of them. Um, I really want to give them each their due. So um, I am going to call them in here. So if I would just single them in one at a time, they can all grab a seat. Y'all give it up for our panelists coming in here today. So um, in, in, in what we have here today, this is going to be different from all the other panel discussions that uh, we've been having because here is this is a student-led panel discussion. This is where you hear it from the word uh, from their, their mouths um, on how far they've gained on what they're doing in their lives because as we all know, uh, social work is just not um, about being a student. You know, you're not a social worker student, you're a social worker first. And um, sometimes I remember that was things that I had to realize and I always push that on other people. And so let them know that you are doing work even though you're in school learning and uh, getting more information as you, uh, uh, as you do your work and becoming a better individual. So um, in introducing our panelists to, to my right is uh, Jose, Rodriguez. He is a MSW student pro at uh, New York University's Silver School of Social Work here in DC. He serves as a, the board for the Glenson New York City chapter where their mission is creating safe 
and inclusive kindergarten to 12th school environments regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. He currently works at the Grace Institute working to destigmatize women in the workforce and focuses on social equality across the domain of race, age, religion, cultural backgrounds, and social economic status. So yes, that's awesome work. Um, right next to him we, is Kendall Benson. She graduated in May with her MSW degree from Columbia University and is lead organizer for the National Advocates for Pregnant Women. A sixth generation Texan, she plans to one day run for the, an elected office in her home state of Texas. As a policy fellow for the National Organization for Women of NYC, she co-authored a report for members of Congress on the need, of, need to reauthorize and expand the 2018 Violence, uh, Violence Against Women Act. In 2018, she was alum of Chris Political Boot Camp. Kendall is passionate about defending reproductive rights, creating economic equality, promoting women's political rep representation, and ending discrimination and violence against women. Uh, next to her is Ali Lozano. She is also a MSW student at the University of Houston, specializing in macro political social work. She is a former political manager of the LGBTQ Victory Fund and has recently served as outreach director for Laura Moser's congressional campaign in Texas 7th District. Ali has been named a rising star by the League of Women's Voters in Houston and was recognized in Outsmarts Magazine's list of top LGBTQ women leaders. She has served on three boards for organizations dedicated to advancing LGBTQ equality and reproductive justice, and is in, in a 2018 alum of Chris Political Bootcamp. Suga Jong is an, an advanced standing MSW student at the New York University's Silver School of Social Work. She has diverse experience in immigration affairs and educational equality, working with the New York City Council, New York Courts, U.S. Congress, and U.N. Habitat. Suga is a founding member of Ideation Worldwide, a nonprofit social innovation organization dedicated to sustainable community development efforts. She received her bachelor's degree in social work and dramatic literature from NYU. And last but definitely not least, Aretha Priera is a MSW student at Columbia University and a Fisher's Cummings Policy Fellow in Residency at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Her interests include education policy, urban development, sustainable housing, urban farming, and agriculture and organizing in the community of color. Aretha is also a 2018 alum of Chris Political Bootcamp. Her interest in pol politics stems from running and being elected class president in the eighth grade. <laughs> she believes, she believes that the power and the opportunity in this country needs to be transferred from the hands of the few to the hands of the many. When she is not in school or challenging the system, you can find her in a park taking a nap or a hike <laughs> and eating vegetarian treats or dancing. Y'all give it a round of applause to our, our panelists. <laughs> and so you can see the star, the star power that I'm working with in ensuring that uh, they all bring about their own perspectives of what they're doing in the field of social work and how they are making change within our communities. Um, so what this, social, what this panel was uh, brought on about, it was brought on from um, Nancy McLean's book, um, Breaking the Chains. And um, from there, what w the discussion came to be, if you ever get a chance to read her book, it is she, she touched on things that talked about how we got to where we are 
and she looked at all the events that happened and that led to that that moment and talked about very much the trauma that has engulfed our our country um, in the development, the history from the laws to um, to the systemic uh, things that we as social workers continue to fight to this day. And the question that arose from that is, how can social workers uh, save democracy? Because obviously we have the power to make change and we advocate, we are one of the most biggest people that advocate for others and empowering them to be who they are and making change within their communities because we, f we feel that everybody deserves a fair share in, um, in, in society and, and some, in some cases deserves a second chance, you know, where, where they weren't privileged enough to get to where we were at. And so we're here to develop that platform and it's such a, I'm, I'm honored to be moderating this discussion because I think just by speaking with them behind closed doors and, and, and just off, off camera is, it has been a wonderful conversation that we can sit here for days on days end and really, really exploit um, where we went wrong and how we can make that change. Um, so one of the questions, the first question that um, I want to pose, propose to the uh, panelists is that when Congress fails to act in support of the majority and research shows that the top percent wields greater power in advancing their policy choices, how do we as social workers begin to save democracy? And so um, I would like whoever wants to step up first and, and take on that, that question and I will be coming over there to join you. Hello. Okay, great. Um, so thank you, Daryl, for the introduction. I forgot I wrote a lot of that stuff in there, so it's kind of embarrassing, but we broke the ice, I guess. Um, so I think as social workers, we have a really interesting role in playing um, in politics, in the government, and in writing policy. I think that because we are able to look at problems um, just beyond like a macro level, we're, be able, we're able to see the micro, the mezzo, and the macro levels and problems, we're able to see them in a different way. They're not just black and white to us. There's many things that go into a problem. I think that we um, can have a really important voice in beginning to save democracy and like bringing ourselves uh, into those conversations. So for example, you know, it, the federal government might see homelessness as an issue that's costing us a lot of money, right? Or something that we need to that's kind of making our country look bad. Um, and someone might just see it as like, okay, let's put a bunch of funding into shelters and just kind of try to get people off the streets. We as a social worker can come to the table and actually see the face behind homelessness or people experiencing homelessness, see that there's trauma involved with that. There's trauma in living um, and experiencing homelessness. See that there's a lot of barriers to entry into shelters, for example, right? So if someone is, um, is tackling substance use or has substance use issues. It's a, there's a lot of barriers to even get into shelters in the first place. Um, someone can't even get in with their partner. So those kind of things. We also see it on the meso level, how it's affecting the community. So folks working at shelters might be stretched out to their last limb. You know what I mean? They're not getting those supports that they need. They're not getting the funding that they need. Um, and we see how it's affecting the community as well. If a community doesn't have a voice in how to tackle a problem, I don't know if the problem will ever be solved. So we can see it from those different levels. Um, and I think we have a really interesting opportunity. We're also able to bring in voices that have been left out um, and really advocate for communities that haven't been a part of the policy discussion. So. Yes, I totally agree that social workers should be part of the policy making process. Um, I think not just social workers, social work as a profession, as a field of study, need to reroot with our origin in community organizing. I think some, okay, I'm sure some people may disagree with me, but as a macro focused social work student, I'm always baffled by the trend that a lot of social work schools in the US are educating their students, no matter what their interests are, for private practice. 
um, yes, yes. you know, like social workers, like we, the, our profession was born out of social movements, like this need to respond to social and economic disruptions. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do private practice. I think we should do everything. You know, there are a lot of roles that we can play, but no matter what you do and where you are, it is imperative for our for us social workers to not just be advocates to our individual clients, but to the communities, to the society at large. So I really appreciate all of you for showing your presence on the Hill in DC and really speak to uh, the larger impacts that we can definitely launch. Hello. Great. Um, that is actually a perfect segue into what I wanted to say. So I am also a macro political specialization at the University of Houston. And one of the biggest ways that I've seen that social workers can really help save democracy is to really take an active um, frontline approach into expanding the electorate. And so um, what we've done at the University of Houston is with the incredible support of our dean, we have really taken that very seriously. And so during every orientation, we actually get all of our students registered to vote and or deputized as volunteer registrars so that they can register other people to vote as well. Um, this year, we also uh, just implemented the very first voter engagement and political justice initiative, and I was the student staffer on that initiative. And the entire aim was essentially to get social work practitioners from the, the overall community as well as our social work students um, connected with local organizations that were doing explicit intentional voter registration outreach to underrepresented communities in the Houston area. Um, so we took a very, um, a very serious active approach um, in, in trying to expand the electorate so that more people's voices could be heard in our democracy. Something I also encountered that I think this, that I think social work as a profession really needs to have a conversation about is I was getting calls from uh, some alums from our program who were um, based in agencies working full time just as a social worker who were asking their clients if their clients were registered to vote. And some of these agencies, their supervisors were getting upset and saying that asking a client if they were registered to vote wasn't professional and wasn't appropriate. Um, so I think there's also a need to really sort of confront the culture that we have in our profession that social workers are inherently non-political. Um, and that really goes off to, to what you were saying. And so um, I'm happy to say that University of Houston is really, um, they're, they're very encouraging of the student body to not only get registered to vote and actively participate in democracy, but also taking a lead role in expanding the electorate and making sure that underrepresented voices are heard and, and exercising that power, so. And, oh. Hello? Oh, great. And kind of going off of that, one thing that I think is really interesting is I think the title is, um, Can Social Workers Save Democracy? And it's almost, that's not even like in the forefront of my mind. The forefront is like, we have to try. It's not, can we? Oh, no, we can't, we won't try. No, we have to, we have to try. Um, and that that is part of our code of ethics. Um, I'm gonna be a little bit of a dork. I think it's section 6.04 um, of our code of ethics <laughs> that says that we have to be politically engaged, that we have to lobby. Actually, it does not say have to, it says should. So we should lobby, we should be politically engaged, we should know what's going on in the political arena, we should know how it's impacting our clients, how it's impacting our community, how it's impacting our own lives. Um, and that we should be igniting this change. And so it's, it's not, you know, can we, it's, it's what are we gonna do? Um, if you do not have the financial means to go to a rally, you know, that's okay. But if you, um, you know, if you don't feel safe going to a protest, that's okay. But the, what really matters is that you try in some other way, that you have a conversation with your neighbor, that you talk to your friends about issues that are really important to you, and that in some way, shape, or form, you try. Um, and that's, I think how we are going to save democracy and then continue to promote democracy. But yeah, I think that that's kind of all around my kind of guiding principle is like, oh no, wherever you're at, direct practice, if you're you know, on the policy arena, like you have to be trying in some way, shape or form. It's literally part of our code of ethics. Hello, okay. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I want to echo what everyone just said. I think that um, social work is a collective reach. It is a collective effort. And 
you're not just diagnosing someone. You're not just in a clinic of uh, running operations. You're not just in the community. It's all of those facets that really make social work what it is as a dynamic field. And I think that in order for us to inform policies and do that work, we need to have one another's backs, you know? It's like, ah, uh, this is my lane. No, this is all our lanes. Like, while you're with a client, do they have the information to who's running for offices? Like, do they have that? Like, that's in a conversation you can bring up. And um, to Ali's point, like, I think that if we are more encouraging, uh, encouraging, if we're encouraging those conversations to happen, then it will take away that stigma and take away that pressure that like, oh, this is what we do. We cannot look like any other field because I mean, we can make the field whatever we want to look like, and I think that we do a great job of doing a lot of things, and that sometimes like stretches us thin. But I think the work speaks for itself. When you go to a community center and you know you have your mental health professionals, you have your um, peer specialists, you have your um, like everyone there just supporting you. That we need to all take that effort and um, make it, you know, a collective effort. That's it. I, I told you, man, I'm, I'm with a team of all-stars here. <laughs> um, you guys are so motivating, uplifting, man. The conversations that um, that you guys, um, what the answers that you guys just provided is just all all part of the pie. And, it, and it's a, such a big question that that we, we ask ourselves and when we think of it as indivi individually, it's like how how do I start it and how do we keep it going and how do I promote it? Um, and one of the things that I recognize is is that everybody here has been in has gotten their degrees and really believes in education um, and really believes in teaching and getting those registered voters out to vote. Um, get, getting people to know more about what we're doing. And so with the attention span of people lasting 59 seconds, how do we begin to educate people that are suppressed by these policies in place and engage those less, less affected to recognize the privilege to make, the right, to make right a situation that is wrong? Um, so the the f first I want to address the 59 second thing Kendall and I were talking about this in the green room so um, I come from campaign land so I, I have I think six campaigns under my belt at this point and when you're doing a mail piece um, it's it's usually well known that you have 12 seconds to catch the person's attention with a mail piece now they have it at eight seconds so um, 15, I wish I had 59 <laughs> seconds to, to get a point across. Um, now it's typically between eight and 12 seconds um, is, is what they're kind of saying in, in campaign land. And I think, um, and I'll speak for myself, but with, with my social work education now, if I'm, if I'm trying to communicate with someone who either does not agree with me or who I'm trying to you know, empower and, and bring about some, some consciousness raising, um, my social work education, I immediately just want to go to, you know, let's talk about the roots of white supremacy and oppression and then track that all the way back to the exact point I'm trying to make. And so I have to like rein myself in. And and with that realization and that self-awareness, I think the I, I think the goal is always, you know, trying to condense a whole lot of information into something that's digestible and accessible. So I think what's important is really sort of adjusting the the style in the way you communicate depending on who it is. Um, so, you know, if I'm out in the community working with a group who, um, who you know, is really is pretty disengaged and, and doesn't really want to be involved in the political process, then I'm not coming at it using all the acronyms in the world that I know. You know, I'm, I'm coming at it from a very, um, a, a more easily accessible level that's easily digestible. So I think um, as social workers, we're very skilled in doing that and adjusting our way of communicating with different audiences um, and with uh, various clients. So I think um, that's really important. We actually have an exercise that we do in a policy class at the University of Houston um, and you have to talk about a complex policy issue, like let's say campaign finance reform, um, and you have under three minutes to convince someone to come onto your side. 
which has been a very, very valuable um, exercise that, that we've done. Um, it's called a position speech. It's very, very valuable. Um, so I think, uh, I, I think really communication styles um, is really important. And um, I'm still learning how to do that in 12 seconds. Still, I'm a work in progress. <laughs> awesome, awesome. A anybody else want to go ahead and? I would also add to that, you need to talk quickly. Um, and <laughs> you do, you do, you need to talk quickly um, and, and know what you're talking about. And I think what really helps me, so I work at the National Advocates for Pregnant Women. We work to encourage, or we work to encourage, we work to ensure that no one's criminalized for the outcome of their pregnancy if they have an abortion, miscarriage, stillbirth, or give birth. And then where I, you know, I'm at six seconds now, and to kind of bring it home, I like to tell a story um, because people care about other people so much more than they do about conceptual ideas or theories or let me tell you the statistic. Um, and so I say, you know, to kind of root what that looks like, uh, we worked with someone who was pregnant and fell down the stairs and went to the hospital and was um, charged with attempted feticide by a nurse who was like, oh, you know, and then someone's like, how is that possible? And then you kind of bring it back and you're like, oh, well, she was poor and she was talking to the nurse and kind of unloading about how her husband just left her. She didn't have a job. She had two kids. She had thought about having an abortion. She had thought about giving this baby up for adoption. And she was just in a really transient time right now. And the nurse was like, oh, that's intense. And so you kind of bring people into this, this story. Um, and I can promise you that story that I just told you will last with you so much longer than any statistic or any you know fact that I could have just given you. And <laughs> I just know that in the next week you're going to be thinking about it when you're falling asleep and your mind's racing, and you're going to be like, oh my gosh, people are criminalizing the outcome of pregnancies. <laughs> and that's how you turn 12 seconds into someone's entire week, the rest of their month, a new advocate, um, and just getting people really kind of brought on to, to what you're talking about. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So um, one of the things that I loved the most about working with working with them and working with you all is that you guys are all different race of um, of demographics or you come from different areas and it's just it's just not one side of point of view um, so when we talk about equality the undertowing um, the undertowing driving force of much of our perspective is our culture and experiences what must we do um, in addressing race and ensuring our policies does not unintentionally exclude a particular culture? And so I would ask somebody who hasn't spoken yet to take that on. Um, I will go. Uh, I think I will share a little bit more about my personal background. Um, so I'm an immigrant. Uh, I moved to the US. With my family, when I was a kid, I was born and raised in Beijing, China. Um, so you know what, growing up in the US, I, I can say I, I was raised in the double shadow of model minority and the good immigrant, whatever that means. Uh, so you know, just looking at my identities, like people rarely assume that I have any major problems or challenges, but that's not the case. I mean, I'm very blessed with the opportunities to go to college and sit here to share my stories with all of you myself, but most people like me cannot do that. Um, so, you know, as social workers, we have to be really aware of the privilege we have that, you know, we have the opportunities to go to the Hill, to, you know, speak with policymakers, and at the same time, working with the most vulnerable populations in our society. So we are obligated to bring the stories, to bring the needs of the voiceless to the wealthy, to the quote unquote, I'm sorry, say oppressors. Uh, so I think this is the power that we have. So we really need to use it and just like bring our diverse experience to people who may not have this exposure and let them know, you know, that there's this wide diversity out there and we should act on it. I basically want to piggyback off of everything that you said. Um, I think too, as social workers, we've hopefully are doing a lot of that work within ourselves right now, like challenging our own 
uh, privileges that we have, challenging our own positionality and our identities, and kind of understanding how something like white supremacy would direct our lives and what that looks like. And I think that we understand that that work is continuous, and it's really important that um, we have those difficult conversations. Like you were saying, we can use, you know, if we are in a space where we are privileged to be sitting to tell everybody my story, or I'm sitting at a table with decision makers, right? Um, we use our experience in having difficult conversations to have that difficult conversation. Like, hey, let's bring these folks to the table. Hey, why did you use that language? Stuff like that. And also, if we can, use our privilege to bring those folks to the actual table themselves. You know what I mean? Like, if we can't do it, we need to have people represented. Um, and we have to bring in the folks that we're making policies for, we have to bring them in the conversation and ensure that their voices are being heard. So. It's, it's funny that you say that because um, I was working on the campaign of Andrew Gillum and, and Bill Nelson back in Florida. And um, one of the things that was brought up a lot was how certain cultures were not being addressed in, in their policies. Um, people weren't being reached out to, even as we were campaigning and trying to reach out to um, get people to vote, get people to knock on doors, to get them to talk about the issues that that really is affecting the community. And from th for those who've never been to South Florida, which is where I'm from, I'm in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, we are like a melting pot of, of communities, of different cultures. Like, it's just not one, it's just not one person. So you got your, we got your Jamaicans, you got your Haitians, and then you got your, you got your Puerto Ricans, Cubans, and other Hispanic cultures. Um, so Jose, for you, how how can we um, begin reaching out to your culture of, I want to believe you're Hispanic, correct? Latinx, yep. So yes, so how, how, how do we how do we begin to reach out, especially when we got different, because I, I hear the topic of, there is, you can't just say, you can't just put a one person who is Hispanic in a bowl like that. There's different ways to reach out to different, uh, different types of Hispanics. Well, I think I want to um, go back a little bit and also say that uh, that I am blessed to like have these identities and I love my who I am. And so it does m drive what I do in social work, but I think that might be a blind spot sometimes where I'm like, um, I might be a little biased when it does come to uh, things that happen in my community. So I think it's up to me, I'll say myself, that I need to be aware of, and like to what you're saying, of like other uh, unrepresented uh, communities and how I can support them. And for me, I'm, I mean, I just try to challenge myself as much as I can. And I've, you know, I think uh, when it comes to like working with people with different religious backgrounds, that's something for me that I, I always try to get the information and try to be as sensitive as possible in those conversations and going to like just, going to that mindset of where they are and um, really empathizing. And so it's tough. It's tough to try to connect when you're in a social work position and you are, you, you're there for a job, but then you're, you're also a human being. So it's, the lines are very blurry, but I think um, all of us need to regulate that within ourselves and um, show up as best as we can. And I think um, it is important to know like, oh, this one representation does not uh, account for everybody in the community. Um, so uh, just knowing that, yeah. I'm gonna bring it back to voting really quick, just really quick. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, so I'm, I'm also Latinx, I'm Latina, and um, something that um, came up actually in, in a report that I was reading a little while ago is that in Harris County, which is the county that Houston is located in, Houston is one of the most diverse cities in the entire country. We have everything. And Harris County is enormous. Houston alone is a little over two million people, I think, at this point. Harris County, four million people. And between, I believe it was, don't completely quote me on the date, but July 2017 through October 2018, of the 158 volunteer, uh, volunteer deputy registrar trainings that were done in the county, um, only two were done in Spanish, and there were none done in Vietnamese or Chinese. 
which is a huge deal when you're dealing with a city as diverse as us. And when I read that statistic, I, I actually became a little embarrassed at myself because my immediate thought was, oh my gosh, I can't believe there were only two done in Spanish and that's it. And immediately my mind did not go to, I can't believe there were none done in Vietnamese and Chinese because we have such a huge Vietnamese population in Houston. So speaking to that blind spot, I think it is being you know, very self-aware and saying, okay, even if my people are at the table, who else is not here at that table? So I think that accessibility piece, even beyond whatever our personal cultures is, is also really, really critical. I love it, I love it. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm out in the community talking about is uh, youth, um, not youth, I don't want to say youth, but young leader empowerment and uh, young, leader, young leader engagement. Um, I think in our society we have this, um, for, um, for me as a millennial, we have this concept that, okay, we need, we're, we're, we're told that we're not pulling our fair share of, of uh, being involved, but yet those that are involved are hitting walls of obstacles that are, are either that people who are in power are not allowing them to be in power. And I see some people smiling in the crowd because this is a conversation that we had uh, <laughs> just like yesterday. But I go around and I, I'm, I'm all about that. I, I like to hear from uh, those people uh, of youthful experiences such as yourselves. Um, talk about this issue as social workers and emerging young leaders. What can we do to change the narrative when faced with criticism that we are too young to lead or we must wait in line. I think also we can add in like social workers in general, not really, doesn't really matter the age, don't really get that much, I don't know, like legitimacy in these political spaces. So I think we need to make sure that we're getting legitimacy. I just think in general we don't have we're in those spaces where we're not seen as legitimate, um, is what I was trying to say in like 10 billion words. Um, so I think to those folks that think that, no matter our age, we can say that we do have a really interesting and important perspective to bring into those arenas and those spaces, and that um, we have a lot to add to the conversation. And I think we just need to keep being sure of ourselves and sure that we do belong in these spaces. Like, for example, I don't know a lot of political terms, I'll be honest. So when I'm in a space where they're talking about a lot of policy and using acronyms that I don't even understand, I'm like so confused and so intimidated. And then I just have to like ground myself, and remind myself, hey, I belong here. Hey, I have something to say that's important. And I can really, you know, make a difference in this space. I just need to be confident. So just adding that in. Awesome, awesome. Kelly, you want to take this on? Sure. Right. So depending on the person and how I'm feeling that day. Um, I would try to not dismiss them, like they kind of maybe just dismissed me, um, and practice those micro social work skills of you know, being empathetic and active listening and telling them that I hear what they're saying, um, but then maybe with the, the sweetest smile on my face, um, pushing back a little bit and being like, you know, what's something that you may want your representative or the, your city council person to know? Or what's something that, you know, what's a question that you would ask someone? And then kind of give them my answer. Because maybe I do have the, you know, the stuff. Um, and they just haven't heard it come out of my mouth yet. And so they just can't believe it until I say it. Um, or maybe say, you know, what, what do you think would really help me um, further my career? Because people love it when you ask them their opinion um, because it shows that you value them. And, and taking that with a grain of salt and then maybe going on to the next person who does believe in you and who does think it's your time, and who does think that you are certainly old enough, um, and just kind of keep going. But definitely not dismissing the person, making them feel heard, mm -hmm. making them like you a little bit more, putting a good taste in their mouth instead of just like the sour taste in your mouth when you leave, and then just being like, yeah, so maybe, maybe you think I'm great. Maybe you will vote for me, you know. Oh, I just think of one thing, you know, in when, when we're working with our clients, we always say, safe space, but I think for us social workers, just based on what my colleagues just said, we need a brave space to be leaders. You know, Dr. King has said that the time is always right to do what is right. So I guess there's no perfect timing for us to lead and act. 
um, yeah, so it's just, I think we just really need just to not underestimate the impacts of what we have on ourselves and also on each other, you know, just really create this brave space for, uh, for our colleagues and for all the young leaders out there uh, to really just like, you know, contribute their potentials and competencies to our society. What, what is one area that, um, and I'm asking this to the panel, what is one area that we can find that is a brave space for us to start speaking up? Say, I'm sorry. Um, places, oh, okay. places like Crisp. I mean, this is a great place for like-minded people to come together and be inspired. I mean, I said I want to run for a local office, and I'm like, Allie, will you be my campaign manager? You know, like <laughs> I said that the first time I met her, just because I was like, oh my gosh, look at this dynamic person. This is so cool, and just you know, wanting to keep in touch with people. I, I this is an incredible network of of just really great people. And so having, thank you, Dr. Lewis, for creating spaces like these, these brave spaces. Um, yeah, Chris. I, I think a way to create a brave space also is I think there's definitely power in numbers. So anytime I go to a political fundraiser or a political event in Houston, I always make sure to tell my entire class about it. And I ask if anybody wants to go with me because you'd be shocked, at the, or maybe you wouldn't actually be shocked, the number of young people who, you know, the the a political fundraiser can be intimidating if you've never gone to one before. If you're not going alone, it's a lot less intimidating. So I always, 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 and whenever I was working for my candidate in the congressional race last year, every event we had, I would invite my entire class so that it was like less scary. And um, you know, power in numbers. It's just it's easier to be brave when you have someone sitting right next to you, you know, who's who's definitely on your team and who knows where you're coming from. Um, so I always make it a point to extend an invitation um, to as many young people as I can. And I think the other bravery part um, is really just showing up. So I've I've been on three boards of directors for three different organizations, and I've been one of the youngest, if not the youngest person, on every single one of those boards, which has not always been easy, but. I have found that changing that narrative, a big part of it is just to always continue to show up. Very Brene Brown, but it's definitely true. Just always showing up and and um, and really speaking your mind and giving an opinion. I would also just like to say there was a um, study that was done from Pew Research Center that said that young people um, are able to decipher fact from opinion <laughs> way better than older Americans. Um, and so that's personally a characteristic I would like in my future leaders. Um, and so, so if I, <laughs> so whenever I find, you know, sort of my intelligence being questioned by, by somebody, I just like to bring that, have you read this study from Pew Research Center? You should really read it. Just Google it right now, you know. Um, and so, yeah, so power in numbers and keep showing up. Awesome, man, awesome. Um, one thing that um, I, I have to kind of do is uh, highlight Dr. Lewis and also my, my alma mater, uh, Barry University uh, from Miami, Florida. They, they, they were the ones that pushed me into Dr. Lewis. And I, I, I too, had attended the Chris Political Boot Camp. But it, unfortunately, I, didn't, was, I was in the inaugural class, which was the year prior. Um, and one of the things that I gained from it was such a passion and such a fire that when in school, um, like I, I would hold back my professors in my last semester in um, because I was so tired of talking and I and 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 I got frustrated. But then when I got out there, I was started to see how much younger I was compared to everybody. And it got, it did get intimidating because I was the only young individual. And then what started to happen is that people started grabbing onto you because you are so young and they want you to do every role and everything. And then as a social worker, we all know that we tend to take on every role and everything. So uh, how do you begin to create a space of self-care while doing all this uh, speaking and moving mountains that 
is with such strength that we don't even believe that we got sometimes, but we tend to move the mountain. How do you how do you how do you tend to take care of yourself um, while doing this amazing work that you all do? It's a tough question. Still trying to figure it out. <laughs> um, no, but I think that, um, like, we all here in social work school, like, supervision and um, making sure that we have a life outside of what we're doing and all these great things. But I think it really just depends on the person and what you are able to take on. Um, because just because social work is known as this doesn't mean that everyone has to do it. Doesn't mean that you have to be this person that is the go-to for everything. Um, I th it's great to say no, and um, <laughs> I think we need to utilize that a lot. Um, you know, and taking self-care further than what the word is, like, you know, it's just, it's not just a fancy word, or not even a fancy word, but like, it's not just like a buzzword that you say, like, actually doing it, mm -hmm. and um, holding yourself accountable to actually take care of yourself. Like, <laughs> Um, I think burnout is such a high frequency word in our profession. Uh, so I think in terms of self care, self care for me, it's just not to, you know, relax. I, I think for self care, one thing is really important to me is just to remind me of why I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, if 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 that is not there, if I you know, I'm oblivious of my mission as a social worker. I think relaxation simply would not remove that burnout for me. Uh, personally, I'm um, I'm a Christian, so church life is very big for me. Um, I mean, that's where I, you know, I I'm being reminded of the bigger purpose of, you know, why God put me in the position that I'm in. But I think, you know, for every single one of us, like we have different support groups or sources of support. But yeah, just like find a group of people or something that will remind you of your purpose, that will keep you going, even though that, you know, our job is very like tiring. Uh, but yeah, so find someone that will remind you why, why, it's just why you're a social worker, what you're doing, what you're doing. Yeah. I think to add to all of those things too, just knowing that you can take a day or two or three to kind of just step out of things and like reground yourself. And what Jose was saying, boundaries are really, really important. Um, so knowing that you can say no and that that's fine and not everybody needs to rely on you for emotional support just because you're a social worker. Um, you can take a step back and be like, no, I can't handle it today. Um, I personally, I mean, I said in my bio, like to go on hikes and <laughs> like to eat food and listen to music and dance. So just whatever you like to do, just make sure that you're doing that for yourself. Like, even if you're too busy, you're not too busy to like stop and listen to music for five minutes. You know what I mean? Or listen to, or just sit and be with yourself or journal. You're not too busy for that. So you're never too busy for yourself. <laughs> so after this in room 222, Aretha will be doing dance lessons. Can I add on? One thing I really enjoy doing, and again, this is gonna kind of sound a little dorky, um, but the National Association of Social Workers sends out an email, kind of with like little updates about what's going on. Yeah. Like, oh, you know, Harris County just passed a new law that says that you can vote in anywhere. It doesn't have to be your one polling place. And I'm like, yes, um, one for the team. And, and just reading those little triumphs that are happening on a city council level, on a statewide level, you know, international, um, really, really helps me just because the news seems to paint the world as if it's on fire, and that can be really draining. Um, and then it's also just icing on the cake that these are social workers that are going out and doing this good. And it's just, it's it really, every day, I'm just, you know, like reading through, and there's only a couple stories, and sometimes it's just the headline because you don't have a lot of time, but you're like, yes, we're doing it. There is progress. It may not seem like it all the time, but we are slowly inching towards progress. That's That's really helpful for me. Aren't they amazing, y'all? <laughs> give it, give it up for them. <laughs> so, what we want to do now at this portion is we want to start taking question Q and A from the audience. I know um, I have my uh, lovely colleague working with me in uh, Adrian getting the cards. You should have gotten a card. Um, do we have? 
do we have any card? Can you? you know, um, while while she's collecting the the cards, uh, I just want to give a shout out to uh, uh, NYU for allowing us to host such a wonderful panel. Um, this is this is a lovely auditorium. Honestly, I did not know there was an NYU in DC, but <laughs> you know, you learn something new every day. So <laughs> somebody said they're everywhere. <laughs> well, sh I am I am learning as I go, and I, I really appreciate this is an amazing auditorium. I they took me back into the green room, and I was like, whoa, I feel like somebody today. So. <laughs> And um, I also want to give a shout out to our viewers on a uh, live stream. I know you're home watching and couldn't be here with us. I, and I, I wanted to let you know that you are missing out some wonderful energy in this room. You, we're sitting, I'm sitting here looking at some great minds and looking at the smiles of the people that really enjoyed it. So if you have a chance, talk to your schools, come back, come to DC and and talk to your legislators on Capitol Hill and, and join Chris. Uh, our political boot camp is coming up. I know Dr. Lewis is uh, plugging that. So if you are interested in joining a P Chris political boot camp, please reach out to Dr. Lewis. Um, he is that he is that guy. He will get you. He will get you uh, right for that. Um, bring in some amazing people to speak on behalf of uh, that are doing amazing stuff in the Capitol Hill. And I've from that boot camp, I've, m I've made a network with people that still work on the Hill to this day, um, just off of the fact that, you know, I, I, they spoke to me at political at the boot camp and I engaged them and I kept those contact contacts in. So I think it's important that we keep the contact, the conversation going by keeping in touch with those contacts. You know, I may not see them every day, but just sending sending a text message here and there just to check up on them, sending an email out to see how things are doing, following them on Facebook and Instagram goes a long way in building your network. And so um, I urge anybody who's interested in, in macro policy issues, um, interested in uh, uh, politics as well, you know, join it. It's a very, it's, um, it's a very good, um, few days of intense learning on what it is that uh, they actually do in campaigning and things like that. And then that when you actually get into the field like um, I did and, and Ali did, um, it, it is really an eye opening. Um, you really you really don't get no sleep, so it will change your life. <laughs> do we have any questions? Um, well, let's let's Give me, give me a few, and then we'll go from there. Hi, I'm um, I'm Adrienne Geyer, and I've been helping out with some of the uh, stuff for Chris. So, I'm a graduate of UB. Um, I graduated in 2017, and this is my third year participating. So, I have my LMSW. Um, I'm from Buffalo, New York. Um, so, the question I wanted to answer is: um, for those of you that attended Chris, can you tell us about your experience? How was is it beneficial to your development as a social worker? So I wanted to share my story because I got into social work and like most programs as um, Suga, right? Suga. Suga represented, it was clinical heavy. So I found myself in a place where did I just pay all this money for no reason? Like where do I really belong? Because I like policy, like I like talking about politics. I know that the history of social work started with um, policy, like people wanting to help folks who needed access, you know, for housing and things like that. So I came here and I found my place basically. So for me, Chris gave me a very broad view and I'm surrounded by people who share like the same view, even though we all, not the same views, but we all come from different places. We share the same goal of kind of pushing social change forward 
in a positive direction to kind of make sure everybody has a positive outcome. So that's for me, um, and I don't know about anybody else. Thank you, and, yeah. and it's funny, because uh, when, when I came in, I thought this was the first time everybody was meeting, but apparently three of them were, were already friends before, and they were hugging in the green room and, <laughs> and laughing it up. So I was like, wow, this is, this is new. So being, being that, you guys all experienced political boot camp, because that's where you guys met each other. So how was that experience from all, from all three perspectives? Um, yes, that was my third uh, political training um, and by far my favorite because there really was something about being in a room um, getting a political training with social workers. Like it, it just was. And, and there, you know, there's a, there's a healthy macro contingent at the University of Houston, um, but I also, I'm like infamous in the program for just being like very extra when it comes to, I mean, you can tell me about your pet and I'll turn it into a conversation about voting at this point. Like it doesn't take much. And so being, being in, a, in a room for three days with, with really like my people where I could, you know, really express that it, from a social work perspective was just so valuable. Um, and especially meeting Kendall because Kendall's from Houston and so we've had a blast with that since we've met. Um, and so it really was, um, so in terms of my social work development, it was a huge, um, it was, it kind of felt like self-care actually. It really did being in a community space like that um, with other macro political social workers. So yes, extremely valuable. It's also very validating. Yeah. It makes you feel like that this is where you're supposed to be. Um, to be like, this is the boot camp for social workers who want to run for office, run a campaign, manage a campaign, be an issue spokesperson. It makes you feel like, oh yeah, this is a thing that I can do. Um, and so it was really, really validating. Yes, very therapeutic, very absolutely self-care. Um, and then it was also nice because I had just graduated and so it felt like, you know, at like summer camp, there's that thing, you, that big tower you can climb up and then you get to the top and then they're like, now just jump. And you're like, what? And then you jump, and that bar that you're supposed to grab onto kind of felt like crisp. It felt like this thing that, like, after you've done this big monumental thing, you kind of jump into the scary unknown, and then you're grabbing onto something, and then there's just a whole other group of people there who are like, and we're here to support you too. Mm -hmm. um, and it's and it's really nice because they're all over the nation, and we had like a spreadsheet that was like, okay, who here would like move to be on someone's campaign, and what would you do, and like what states? Um, and so to kind of be like, you know, you're building your team, um, it makes it all the more real. And, and that's also just really inspiring and um, really, really nice. 10 for 10 recommend the Chris Boot Camp. Yeah, to just reiterate everything that you folks said, it was just so exciting. Like I'm coming to, into this as like a person who was kind of new to the idea of like even being in politics or policy. And so I was kind of intimidated at first, even with social workers, like, oh, I don't know anything. Like. I don't know what to, I, I don't know, I went in a little bit anxious um, and came out super confident and really excited and really jazzed up that there was all these really cool folks talking about really great things that were are going to do great things. And I'm like, yes, I want them to be, and myself, in places of power and making decisions. Like, it was just really re-energizing to know that we can have like a group like this and we could make all these awesome connections. So I'm just gonna babble on, but it was great. If you have a chance to go, you definitely should. Awesome, awesome. Um, how can, um, this is a question from our audience, uh, how can we push for these conversations and actions on our campuses? So uh, I believe you guys are all, well, except for one, how, you guys are still on in, on campus, right? Mm -hmm. And I know it's, it's a different feel when you're going for your master's than you're going for your undergrad, honest, honestly, personally speaking. But uh, how can you push, how can we continue to push these conversations on our campuses for actions? <laughs> Suga, you wanna take this? Or? They go to the same school, just. just yes, <laughs> yes, we go to the same school, but I think for me, I'm in a very peculiar situation that, you know, like I went to the same school for undergrad and grad, but like, my grad degree is only one year, so I can say I'm still fairly new to the graduate culture at NYU, but I know we have so many student clubs. 
um, especially targeting underrepresented social workers. Uh, I know we have clubs for uh, AAPI social workers, for black women social workers. Uh, yeah, so I think recognizing the underrepresented groups at your campus and create a coalition or a club for them is very validating. It's very empowering, um, you know, as an Asian American social worker, you know, knowing that there is an Asian American social worker group on my campus, even though, you know, our population is tiny, but still, like, that's very validating to me, and knowing, oh, like, my presence is acknowledged by my profession and my field. So, yeah, I think this coalition um, and clubs is very, it's definitely a great way to start uh, your advocacy process on your campus. And that, that goes to the brave space that you were talking about. And, of and course, creating. yes. <laughs> um, who, are some of, who are some role models slash leaders within each of your own areas of interest? Mm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my gosh, number one. I don't know if she's what. Dr. Suzanne Pritzker. So. Kendall knows I love her. So there is a textbook that came out last year called Political Social Work. It is like the only textbook solely dedicated to political social work. And Dr. Suzanne Pritzker wrote it with Dr. Shannon Lane, um, who is based on um, here on the, I was going to say on the East Coast. I'm on the East Coast right now. Um, and um, it's it's just like, it, it was like when that book came out, all the political social workers in our program were like, oh my God, a Bible just for us? This is so exciting. Um, and actually, our dean is, is here today, and um, our dean introduced me to, to Dr. Suzanne Pritzker, and um, I was just like, okay, I, I get it. All her research and all of the work that she's done throughout her career, she started in, in politics in Virginia. Um, and it made it so easy. I was like, oh, that's what I want to be when I grow up. I get it now. Yes, political social work is for me. Um, and then also our dean is one of my biggest social work role models um, as well. And then um, also I would like to say in terms of elected officials, Sylvia Garcia, who just entered Congress, is a social worker and from Houston. So we are majorly um, Texas Houston proud of Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia, who is um, an amazing, amazing so social worker and always makes sure to identify herself as a social worker, um, which I have really taken to heart. And so I always try to do that in any public space that I'm in is to identify myself proudly as a, as a social worker. Awesome. Any, anybody want to take that take on that question as well? You want to move on to the next one? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, in a major social in major social movements, social advocates uh, used uh, media to try to control headlines and content to influence change. As millennials, how can we dominate social media platforms to shift dialogue? to push advocacy to the forefront of this change, of our desired change, sorry. I'll, I'll take a whack at this one. Go ahead, swing away. Um, so I actually wanted to bring up social media when we were talking before, but I just didn't do it. So I think we have such an interesting, like social media, and let me just, put this as a side note, I'm terrible at it, but I'm gonna speak to what I see. I think we just have like such an interesting time with social media, like such, an, such a new thing where people can like be connected to so many different things and like follow on to movements because they saw it and it looked like something they like in like two seconds, it's crazy. It's crazy and it's powerful and I think as millennials, if you're really talented at social media, like you're scrolling through Instagram, you're like, hey, you know what, I could do this better than somebody else or decorate this, just like go with those talents, honestly. Or if you're really good at tweeting, I'm terrible at tweeting, by the way, just like mine's like 20 sentences and it like is a whole novel that I want people to read and it's just like, I'm not good at it. But if you're really good at tweeting, if you can like get your point across in like a few words, then go for it. I think like, it's so powerful and people might say like, oh, we're on social media too much, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, that's true, but also use it to your advantage. Like, I have a quick example. I had a friend who literally went viral on LinkedIn and now um, got offered to speak at like 
Ted London. So went viral on LinkedIn and now has a TED Talk. So social media is so, so powerful and we can really use it to our advantage. So if you're good at that, please help me out too. And I also think that with that, we need to be conscious of how we're using it and uh, make sure that we're not abusing our power when we're using it because I think it can be so easy to kind of coerce people in like the wrong direction. And so um, it, it can do tremendous things as far as getting that support you need and s reaching people all over, but just to be mindful of you know, what we're saying, the content we're saying, the, le the legitimacy, so yeah. And for the record, um, yes, I'm terrible at marketing as well. <laughs> so <laughs> I've been pushing them to make sure that they are marketing themselves and doing something so wonderful. We don't give ourselves sometimes credit for what we're doing. And, and it, it feels like, oh, um, I'm just tapping, patting myself on the back. But sometimes we need that, especially especially in, in the field that we work in and work with individuals. We need to go back in and make a box of all of the success that we have done and look back at it, especially when we're hit with a lot of failures or what we think are failures, is to go back and look at all the things that we have done um, in helping us move forward. So yes, please make sure you guys share this when you get home. Uh, this is also me live stream if I haven't said it, so make sure you share it on your social media platforms and take a lot of pictures and post it to Chris Page and everything like that. So that's my marketing spill. Oh yeah, and uh, and 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 uh. Oh, and follow us too, please. Don't don't be that. Please don't be that person that just that just taps and likes and doesn't follow. Follow us back. We'll we'll definitely follow you. <laughs> um, and so I want to ask this question. I'm looking at the time. I, I'm conscious of it. I'm so, but we're good on time. Um, burnout is not just about what we do as individuals, but the and the unmanageable workloads expected by organizations as future organizational leaders. How will you design better policies to support social workers under, the, under your leadership to prevent burnout? Go ahead. I'm trying to think where I read this, um, but it was, it was an article and it was talking about how the best things that leaders can do for their organizations are one of the best things that leaders can do for their organizations. Um, is lead by example. Mm -hmm. And so if you have kids and you need to leave early one day to take them you know, to a doctor's appointment to be like, bye, I'm gonna go take care of my kids. So to kind of set that example of showing people that like you can be human, um, you can go and have that sick day, you can go and take that mental health day. I work at a great organization that offers sick days and mental health days, which I'm just like, thank you, I see that. Um, and I, it really helps set an example of like, okay, like my organization understands that I can take a mental health day. That says a lot about my organization. That's really incredible. And they understand that that's different than a sick day and that's different than a vacation day. Um, and so when you kind of lead by example, um, I think that's just one of the best things that you can do. Um, unfortunately, my limited experience would only allow me to answer that question from from a perspective of employee, not as an organizational <laughs> leader yet. But I think just uh, not that many workplaces, at least that I've been in, really take the time to understand and assess my strength and interests. Because I feel like you know when I'm doing thing, so when I'm doing something that I'm passionate about. I'm good at, you know, like I don't mind workload, you know, at least like, you know, that's like, I mean, it is a lot of work, but you know, that's not a barrier for me to performing and, you know, exceeding what, uh, you know, the expectations imposed on me. But when I'm doing something that I don't like or I'm not good at, like even it's like so little work, but I'm like, oh man, you know, I have to do that. You know, I don't have that motivation to do so. So just, you know, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of leaders in the audience and we will be leaders one day in the future that, you know, just take some time to understand the people you work with and really maximize their strength and just really instill this motivation in them and the result will be phenomenal. I want to also say to Suga's point that I have advocated for so many things at my workplace <laughs> that um, I'm pretty sure everyone's tired of me, but that's okay. Um, I, th I think it's important to 
allow that space, like to your, to your point, like, oh, what am I good at? What am I not good at? And who can I rely on? I think being as supportive and collaborative as possible is important. Uh, even though you're the director of development, hey, but can you run you know, this program, or like, can you oversee this, or can you put your insight, you know, in, instead of saying like, oh, this is my siloed area, and this is where I um, am good at, you know, like, what else can you do? What else can you take on? And what are you not good at that I can help you with? Um, I think it's important to have that space to advocate for yourself and advocate for the things you want to see in the organization. Um, so. And last question before we have you have you ask before I ask for your closing remarks, is how can we work to build a more trauma-informed immigration system which treats individuals as human beings? For those for those at home, that was a lot of woes in the audience. Like everybody's blown away. How can we work to build a more trauma-informed immigration system which treats individuals as human beings? Can answer it. Sure. Take a um, shot. I think one of the most important things to do is really advocate for folks who have worked with population, those populations to be brought into the conversation and policy making. Um, arena. So I don't know how we begin to do that, but I think we need those folks at the table because they see them as human beings. They don't see them as an immigration problem kind of thing. They see the faces to that. So that's one of the first things we should do. I mean, as an immigrant myself, <laughs> I think what I want to say, you know, to, to social workers who work with immigrants is that I think the best approach to to, to deal with trauma for immigrants is really validating and acknowledging their strength. Because as immigrants, when we come to a new country, we're, you know, we're back to ground zero. We're starting everything from scratch. So just we really need that validation from people in the local, um, the community that we're at to say that, oh, no, you are not nobody. You are not nothing. You know, there are things you can do and there are contributions that you can make, that you are you are a valuable person. You are a valuable threat of to, to, to the fabric of our society. So I think really just like voice that out and let them know that they're valued, they're welcome. I think it's like the very, at, at least, I think is something very important to us. And I also think that it's not just social workers that interact with immigrants. So also implementing some type of infrastructure where everyone is has some type of trauma informed care knowledge because you know it's it can be very traumatizing to come somewhere and not feel comfortable even saying like, oh, why you're here, how you, you got here, you know? So it's it's very important that everyone knows that, you know, because government officials work with immigrants, so it's like, how can they be better equipped to deal with these situations, speak, you know, the language, like, the language. So, uh, yeah. Awesome, man. Those, those are wonderful answers, um, by the way. So we're, we're wrapping up. We're at that time, that point in time where, um, we got the Q&A done, and so we're going to go out and go ahead and close close it out with some closing remarks from the panelists. Um, before we do that, though, I, I just want to say, man, it's been an honor and a pleasure working with you. Um, I look forward to seeing all the wonderful things that you guys are going to be doing um, or that are you are doing in the field. And now that I, I am aware of you, and I know you, <laughs> I will definitely be following you and liking you and, and being one of your number one chair leaders as you go, go along in this process of growth. Um, so I, I definitely like, though I'm moderating, I'm definitely feel on the same playing field as you all and I'm proud to be a social worker um, with, you, with you all and with you all in the audience as well. So thank you, man. Give, give them a round of applause. <laughs> So in moving forward, now that you guys have gotten a spotlight and you've gotten an opportunity to talk about what it is that 
you believe in and what you what your passion is and I know I read a little brief of your bio what is what is your what do you hope to for people here and people watching at home to take away from this discussion and what are some what are some things that you are doing within your community now that you would like to promote at this point in time marketing Can you repeat that again? Because I forgot already. <laughs> As, <laughs> what do you hope? What do you hope people at home and uh, people here uh, would take away from this discussion and moving okay. forward? Okay. And what is some? What is something that you are doing in um, now that you want to go ahead and promote that, and hoping that people could uh, follow you and, and help join you in, in the whatever your passion is. Okay, great. Um, so one thing that I want folks to take away is that if you are a social worker or if you're a person who has a background working with folks like social workers do um, and you're afraid to get into politics or the political arena or the government, um, just my thing I want to say to you is like not to don't be afraid, you can, but also it's really important that, um, that you're there. You should be there. Okay, wherever you are, you should be there, um, and don't be intimidated by folks, you know, not validating you um, because you didn't have, you don't have a background in public policy or administration or whatever it is. Like you should be at the table and in these discussions. Um, something that I want to plug, uh, one of the things I'm doing at my placement right now, I'm also working for the Department of Housing and Urban Development um, in combination with the VA. And so one of the things that we're really working on right now is consumer engagement. Um, and that means I work in um, the SNAPS office, which is Special Needs Assistance and Programs. So many acrony acronyms, I just don't know. Um, and so one of the things we're doing right now is consumer engagement, and that's really bringing in voices of people who have lived experiences into the conversation and into the policymaking arena, and we're paying those folks as well. So um, I'm just, one of the things I want to plug is like if you're at an organization that's making, like thinking of different uh, programs or anything like that, we really need to have folks who have lived experiences making the policies, and we need to pay them for their time, so. Um, I think one thing is that is so powerful and charming to be a social worker is that we are literally everywhere. I think this is something that I found out that I learned, you know, uh, you know, during my social work education. Like last year, my my field placement was in Red Hook. It's a very isolated neighborhood in South Brooklyn, and this year I'm on Wall Street. Yeah, so we're we're really everywhere, and you know we're not like politicians who who just show up for a hot second, you know, on the newspaper or on the or on the TV. Like we work eight hours a day, forty hours a week, where people are, where the oppressors are, where the oppressed are. I think our persistent and active presence is the best reminder to people from all classes that there is still hope and need for social justice. 